Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome. Um, today, I would like to talk to you about how we have used in journal IPFS, in particular for conflict zones. But before I start, uh, I want to ask you all, have you ever been fooled by social media? Could be that you saw an image, a video, that finally it was not what you thought. Who experienced that? We did. I can tell you my personal story. Um, I live in Lisbon, I'm from Spain, but um, I live like one hour away from Nazare. If you don't know, it's uh, where you can surf the biggest waves in the world. So one day I was in social media and then I saw a video of, hey, the biggest record has been achieved, surfing a, a wave. I think it was like 26 meters. I thought, oh my God, I miss it. I was here, I was just one hour away, I didn't check the forecast, and then I miss it. And then suddenly when we started checking, we realized that that video actually happened months ago. So it was not actual uh, and it was not true. So what if this happens in much more critical situation and environments? Well, this is what has happened in Ukraine also over the last months, years. Um, over the course of, from February 2022 until October 2023, more than 3,000 educational facilities have been damaged and more than 300 have been totally destroyed. This is a huge risk, not only for education in general, but also for the kids and professors working there. Why this happened? Well, in the, back, what is, in the background, what is happening also is that schools, to target the schools is a war crime unless it's a legitimate target. And why it could be considered a legitimate target? Because there are military forces inside. So Russian Air Forces claimed that that was the case in some school facilities, um, and it was not true. So there are two major risks here. One, sharing information that is not true, uh, that could cause the lives of um, many children, and then on the other hand, also, if you have evidences that that was not true, how can you make sure that this information is not destroyed? So these are the biggest vulnerabilities and threat factors that we face, normally with digital material, but in particular with digital evidences. One, the risk of loss, tampering, or damage. It could be direct, but it could be also indirect. It could be because there is a power outages. There are um, attacks directly to those facilities. There are many ways in which this digital evidence, is, even evidence can be attacked. There are novel kinds of digital evidences emerging, which is hard to prove the provenance. So for instance, social media. Some years ago, this was not considered to be a digital evidence, but right now we have this new one on our hands and it's very powerful. On the third place, another risk is the Large technology companies that are normally hosting all this have outside influence. We have been discussing about it. This is why IPFS is also here and why IPFS ha actually hel help us. Uh, but this also involves a lot of risks. Um, it could be how they want to share the host, to share the results. If they decide to have new legislations, everyone would be affected if we only trust in these companies. And then finally, there is cheap, widely available, and extremely powerful generative AI tools that are creating new material. Um, so it's even harder to prove authenticity. So this is where we come in um, as Hala Systems. Um, I'm Begonia, I'm head of product at Hala Systems, but Hala Systems has existed for over eight years, more or less. Um, we develop data-driven technological solutions to protect conflict-affected populations while strengthening accountability for international crimes. So this is what we have been doing through data collection, through preservation, data integrity, artificial intelligence, analytics, and also real-time insights. To put you one, of, one example of how we radically increase resilience for billions of people to forces outside of their control, um, how HALA started was actually with an early warning system that was developed um, in Syria, so that it sent um, alerts to civilians 
normally through telegram channels once an earth strike was detected and was estimated that was going to impact a specific educational facility or hospital mostly. It has been working over the last eight years, um, alerting thousands and thousands of people. And that's how we consider that deliverable, actionable information can really protect everything that matters. So inside this framework, um, inside this IPFS conference and so on, where, where do we stand? Well, uh, I want to bring you very briefly a white paper that is being drafted and that also Lindsay is going to speak after because it's based on Starling um, and HAL Assistance collaboration. And we want to apply this framework for data integrity to digital investigations. So the key highlights for this are, the first one, the way you capture the data is really important. It's important to create a digital recording and the relevant metadata. Yesterday, we, uh, in the open science um, workshop, we were also discussing about the fair principles, in, and almost in all of them, metadata was mentioned. Metadata can really help to link and to bundle the, uh, uh, the file itself with all the information that is underneath, how it was captured, uh, what are the maybe frequencies, what is the format, time, etc. And then with this, we establish a root of trust to notarize that the data is close to the moment of creation. There was a, an interesting talk also yesterday in which we were saying, okay, but how do, we, how do you make sure that you were in the possession of the file or that this file hasn't been altered? And that's why here, as close to the moment of creation is the best. And Lindsay is also going to talk about some methods, some applications that actually help with that. In the moment you take a, a picture, it's already um, hashed, for instance. The second part is the store. The idea with this is to effectively preserve the material for the long term. As you can imagine, in international investigations, it takes ages to really go back to the data, to really go back to the evidences. So that's why there are different recommendations that are followed here in order to make sure that this, it is preserved for the long term. One is this bundle encryption of being able to register or to preserve the file itself with the metadata. Second, if you need to consider what is the retention period for this data and how available it's going to be over time. Think one more time. How frequently are you going to access this data? Sometimes the data is closed and it's not open until a specific moment in which you need to really retrieve it fast. But normally all this time, it's stopped, it's closed. Nobody is accessing, to this, accessing this data. So data retrieval is extremely important uh, to be able to extract it, and that's why this content identifier is the singular guarantee that we need for digital files. And finally, once we have captured the file the best way possible, we have stored it for the long term, how do we validate and enhance this material? Well, this process is involved in processes, workflows that aim to investigate, scrutinize, contextualize all the info that has been recorded. So there are also some recommendations on this. This information needs to be organized. It needs to be browsable. So think about it. You must probably need kind of a UI. Exploration is needed and iteration. And what do we mean by iteration? It means, for instance, to be able to do annotations to the files. And if you do an annotation to the file, it needs to be then recorded. Who did this annotation and when? So then you will end up with a whole story, with a long tale of how this material has been um, used. And then finally, finally, you need to be able to export it afterwards. So in a nutshell, this is also a schema that summarizes this, everything that I've explained. First, the item, the content with the metadata, should be bundled, and this includes also hashing these files, signing for provenance to make sure who was in the possession of the file, and then registering with third party record holders. In the second place, you have to bundle it. So this means the content, the metadata, hashes, signature, and then you need to store it for the long term in the centralized storage. And then in order to prove its integrity, you need to be able to do a one-on-one -on -one comparison and in order to prove the chain of custody of this file. So with this framework in mind, these are, again, recommendations in general of this framework to, to lower the uncertainty of the information that we have and to enable, in general, 
investigators to move confidently the information, to hand off to prosecutors this digital material um, in a way that can prove and, um, the, the chain of custody. Yeah. So what we did at HALA was, okay, let's use this framework, let's implement it, and I'm going to show you how. Um, you're going to get familiar to this framework because I repeat it several times, so I hope, bear with me, and I will show you the example. So in general, our objective when we started, I think it was one year and a half ago, two years already, is the development and deployment of this cryptographic solution for immutable preservation of data to maintain chain of custody. <coughs> so how we... <coughs> Mm, sorry. How have you, we done that? Let me take you through this process. On the left, you can see the different material. So it could be a text, it could be an image, video, or even a satellite image. Once you have decided which one you want to select, then we take it through our API. In this case, what we do is we hash the data, the file, and the metadata. This is the part. So as mentioned, some examples for metadata of these files are date, time, frequency, the text, um, coordinates could be. There are many, many different ones. Then what we did was we bundle all together with the signature and with the recorded data. The recorded data means how this file has been captured. So we bundle it all together and we also hash it. That this is the blue fingerprint that you can see there. Finally, if you remember, now we have capture. The following part would be to preserve it. So we store it also in a, a S3 bucket and in an immutable bucket. And finally, we also register it in IPFS. In order for it to be available in space and time, what we did was we registered it with the numbers protocol uh, to ensure that it's publicly available. And thanks to this signature that we did, we can prove that we were in the possession of the file in the moment that we registered it. Three key parts, we curate the data, we store it, we generate this asset, and then finally we register with IPFS and numbers, making sure that the data is distributed and safe from corruption. And this is where IPFS really help us. This is the summary of everything that I've been describing. This process right now, it's ongoing, it's in production in our environment. We register twice a day files that we get through all this process that I've explained. So if, uh, as a bundle, the hashing and storage, unique fingerprint. And finally, sent to IPFS for storage and blockchain registration. And that's the last step with Numbers Protocol. We have collab been collaborating with the team. Um, we distribute it. And we using this ID, this information ca can be independently verified at any time in Numbers Protocol. All this process is happening in the backend as you can see, imagine, but how do we make it more accessible for users? This is something that we were discussing also in the panel yesterday. Um, all this technology, one, it's not very accessible for non-tech people, and also on the second hand, it's not, it doesn't have normally a user-friendly UI. So what we did was we, from the product perspective, we thought about a couple of cases in which we could use or surface this uh, registration. On one hand, we thought, all right, how do people normally store these files? So imagine that they store it via OneDrive or Dropbox or any other storage provider. One option is that they could even register, we could connect with them and they could even register the files there. So you could see in the, um, in the front end, you could already see if the file has been verified by the protocol or not. And this second example is actually coming from a, a real product that we have at HALA. Um, and the idea is if we have different audio that has been collected, how you can also see, check on the file, and get all the information that is needed um, to ensure that this file has been registered and preserved properly. So as you can see, here you can have the name, the description of what it is, but then that it has been verified with the node ID, with the registered key, and also where it has been anchored. 
to summarize and also to share some of the key challenges that we have faced, both on the technical and on the accountability side. On one side, on the technical side, um, the key IPFS challenge for us was ensuring this availability of the system. So that means in terms of space, assets being available across all gateways, and also of time, that the file is not forgotten after time. So this is where numbers actually help us to solve this challenge, because in the rest, in general, um, it was very easy to use. I, I also gathered feedback from the engineers, the Web3 engineers. Um, IPFS was extremely useful um, to use to manage and very reliable, like it's all. Also, um, some technical actions that will follow, as you can imagine, is we want to register the files, but on, not only in the moment of creation of as close as possible to the source, but also you've seen that we could have AI processes, for instance, to those files. So how do we register these files in the different steps? So whenever you treat this file, you process it, you want to register it. Then if you have an annotation, you want to register it again. So we would like to apply it to the different process. And then also we want to implement this registration in other products, so to implement this UI um, to make it more accessible. And then it links with the accountability challenges. The key accountability challenges, to summarize it and to make it very clear, are two, applicability and accessibility. Not everyone has the technical knowledge or even the access to this technology. So how can we bridge this gap that exists right now between legal procedures and tech? So that's why our accountability experts will need to gather feedback with all this framework that we have, with this process that we have implemented, and create concrete steps, not only for the profiles here in Brussels, but also for the uh, people on the ground on how they could use it and how they could start testing this. So hopefully, thanks to this framework, to this technology, we can really lower this uh, information uncertainty and we can be a, a step closer um, and to give the best chance possible to digital material to be accepted or admissible um, in courts or in international cases. Thank you very much.